Hello, everybody. This is the quest for the best director podcast. I'm Matthew Moore. And joining me is a guy who owes half the people in this Discord channel money. Caleb Ferguson. Caleb, what's going on? Oh, I'll just call you Caleb Boy. <laughs> I like that. We should keep that. Okay, Caleb I'm, Boy. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm kind of tired. Long day at work. What <laughs> you're telling me? Ate some fried chicken. That was tiring. Wasn't it, Kiana? She's saying it was exhausting. I actually don't think she really was listening. Speaking of, everyone give a hand to our live studio audience. I don't know where that came in, but I went with it. But also joining us is a guy who is looking for an otoku himself to become a better podcaster. <laughs> Derek Schwarzynski. Um, Derek, what's going on? Uh, Mike Troubles, apologize if it's a problem and it upsets people. Um, I'll yeah. do my best. So, Derek, I'm going to be real with you, buddy. It's not the... Im- it's the length of time you talk it's the issue, not the amount of words. So, if you are trying to think about your sentences and it's take, and that can take longer than if you said the sentence, you just say the sentence. You know, ideally, think about this before, and maybe write it down like a haiku, you know? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking haikus all the time. It's very fitting that's, for the that's story. That's brand for Derek, moments. too. Yeah, and this week's podcast. Both Scorsese and Mizuguchi, big IQ fans. I keep going calling Miyazaki. Hayao. Yeah, he's not Miyazaki. Very different. Okay, Derek, their names start with the same thing. They're both directors from Japan, okay? Jesus Christ. Anyways, this week's movies are. The Story of Last Chrysanthemums by Kenji Mizuguchi and Mean Streets by Martin Scorsese. Scorsese. It's another one of those. It's like very ambiguous, I feel like. No one really knows. Anyways, um, Story of Last Chrysanthemums about this actor who is actually a really bad actor. He falls in love with a woman who makes him a better actress, but he has to basically leave his uh, mainstream acting career for her. And then he leaves her for a mainstream acting career and she dies. And the other one is Mean Streets, which is about these young lads, Charlie and Johnny Boy. Uh, we're trying to figure out their way through New York. Johnny Boy's a bit rambunctious, always causing this trouble, always owing people this money. And uh, eventually it comes back to bite them. When Michael, this loan shark, uh, gets fed up with it. And, uh, presumably murders Johnny Boy? I guess we can talk about that later. Okay, guys. Which move? This is the last movie of the second round. We're like seventy-five percent done with this podcast, which is super weird. What do you guys want to start with? Start with Main Street. Derek, you want to start with Main Streets? Yeah, because I'm feeling mean. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Now that uh, Derek's been sufficiently mean, we can start. Caleb, what are your thoughts on Main Streets? Hmm. I like. So you've really been using this prep time well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I got a lot, a lot of different things to talk about. It's hard to choose where I'm going to start with. Okay, I'm sure. First mm-hmm. off, I think one of the most notable things about this movie is the use of music, which is uh, really cool. And I feel like a lot of later movies definitely took inspiration from Main Streets in the yeah, way like they're Yeah, very Tarantino movie. Yeah, definitely. And like the way they'll use like um, music to like set up shots is cool. Um, a lot of like cool stuff with like shaky camera, which is something I would normally not say because normally shaky cameras are pretty annoying. But the, he Scorsese like does it in just the right way to where like it's not so shaky you can't tell what's going on, but it gives a little bit of flavor. Like a couple examples are like one where like it's like right in the beginning where he like wakes up and the camera is like kind of shaky, like following his face as he sits up suddenly, um, but then like immediately sits like settles down. So it's kind of like the perfect amount to sort of like give you this sense of like the disorientation of just waking up and then also like another great scene is when uh he's like meandering his way through some like really drunken party and it's just like the whole the camera is like focused on his center of his face the whole time as he moves around like 
just like directly in front of his mm-hmm. face. It's really cool. And that whole party is like this big blur. You don't really understand what's going on. Yeah, like, which is it, it's a really good st- job of like kind of distorting your like uh like I guess I don't know like, sense of location. What are you gonna say? Yeah, they, like it, he basically uses these like interesting shots to really like further that like subjective feeling of like being at like some really zany party and you're really drunk and stuff like that. Yeah, and even when he's not really doing this POV thing, he's still like focusing on like these really weird spots, right? Mm-hmm. Like that like don't really make sense like to focus on to kind of confuse you a bit more. It's kind of what's like at the party to kind of just focus on something and it's all you see, you know? Well, what's an example of something weird that he focuses on? Like, like these two guys at a table, like, aren't really doing anything. Like, I remember mm-hmm. that that party was linked the one you're talking about. He's like, yeah, he focuses on these guys sitting at this table, and it's like, where exactly is this table? What are these guys doing? And I was like, hey, <laughs> buddy. Was like, huh? What did you think of it, Derek? Um... I thought the shot cop was also very interesting, like, uh, specifically not shaky cam, because I didn't really pick up on that, to be honest, but, uh, what I thought was interesting is that he will do, like, multiple shots through, like, different rooms, so, like, one, uh, specifically, like, a lot of the time in the apartments, he'll show, like, another apartment, but not just, like, the actual, like, interior of it, but you can see, like, through the apartment, so it'll be, like, from, um, what's this guy's name? Not the... John, but the other one, uh, Charlie, from his room into um, Teresa's room, you can see all the way through. So he'll do that a lot of the time. He did that in the bar all the time too, from one room to the another. You can see from one length to like two room lengths, so you get like the logic of all the rooms at the same time. And the bar is super cool about that because where you spend so much time there, we get like a good feel for like where all the rooms are in relation to one another. Like. I yeah, can think exactly. of right now, like where the bathroom is, where the, uh, like where the back room with the tiger is, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, with the tiger, which is so ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> and like not nearly explored enough. I mean, also like low key. This is kind of consistent with this movie. Not the most realistic looking tiger, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it definitely looks stuffed at least at a few points. I don't know if it was exactly how they did it, but yeah. It is just, and this is, I'm going to address this really quick because, like, this is something I feel like is maybe a common complaint for this movie. Is it's definitely, this is, I believe, Squares is his third film. It definitely does not feel like he's quite got his groove yet. You know what I mean? Like, there's something still some, like, very basic technical issues. Like, uh, well, that scene in the beach, do you get what I'm talking about? Yeah. With Charlie and the girl. His yeah. name. What's Teresa, her name? Teresa. Teresa. I think it was a T name. Um, yeah, with Charlie and Teresa. And it's like, the audio is not the best. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, you can tell that um, he didn't quite have, like, all the directorial fundamentals. But like Caleb, you were saying earlier, I think it's a really good job of, like, this kind of atmospheric sort of film. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, uh, they definitely dubbed some stuff in in this movie, right? Such as what? I don't know. It just it definitely seems like with Teresa, like sometimes her vocals seemed like out of place, if that makes sense. Like they had been dubbed in and like the lips might have been a little out of sync. That might have just been, um, you know, like the version I watched or you know, it lagged a bit or something. I don't know. but Yeah, I think I didn't notice that at all. Did you, Derek? Uh, I kind of get what he's saying. I think it was just like the quality of it. I don't know. It might have, I don't yeah. know. I, I feel yeah, like it might have been just like, like an editing like mess up or something. Yeah, yeah. I watched restored versions, so I didn't have any of these sort of things. I see. Mm-hmm. I like the tiger or whatever it was, like a panther because it kind of serves as this like a uh, tiger, yeah. Tiger. I think it was actually a panther. He specifically says that it's a panther and that he really? wanted a tiger. Yeah, he says oh, it's a panther, but he wanted a tiger because, you know, like the, he's, it's, it's a bit, this sort of serves as like a literary reference to the tiger poem. I was never, never done Italian tiger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not what I heard. So I was like, oh, okay, it's tiger. Yeah, continue. 
Oh no, that's just basically it. It sort of like serves as this um, it, as a vehicle for like all these like they have this like brief kind of flurry of like literary references. One of which is the tiger, and then he makes another one that I can't recall, but sort of interesting and because you don't know, you really get anything like that through the rest of the movie. But we sort of have this like very like I don't know like some literary references thrown in kind of randomly, which is interesting. I think the movie is kind of all over the place in that manner, though, you know what I mean? Where, although it is like definitely atmospheric, it's also like lacks, it intentionally lacks this consistency, mm-hmm. right? Because you know, the lives of these two guys, Charlie and Johnny Boy, and, you know, I guess Michael to like a lesser extent, it mm-hmm. is very inconsistent, you know? Yeah, that's um, true. Like, there's a scene where, I think, was it right after the shooting, maybe? I think it was right after, like, not the first shoot, not the last shooting, but the first, the big fight at uh, that larger guy's place. Yeah, yeah, Joey. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, Charlie and Johnny start, like, fighting each other with trash cans. It's just so goofy and, like, almost out of place for what this movie is, but it works so well. Yeah, I think that seems actually pretty important to, like, oh, the for greater, sure. like, narrative of the film. Because, like, he sort of, Charlie sort of has this narrative in his head that he's, like, Johnny Boy's, like, savior, or, like, he needs to be nice to Johnny Boy and help him and all this stuff, because no one else is going to. But I think this scene shows that, like, in reality, him being with Johnny Boy is really just an indulgence, and him getting a chance to act like a dumb kid and play around with trash cans and stuff. So it's not really, like, a moral thing, it's more, like... No, I thought it, yeah, I understood it more definitely. as a moral, moral thing. I thought that was like the whole point of like him going the church scenes and stuff, and him being like, all uh, like this is supposed to be like him trying to be like his redemption in his own way, is like helping out Johnny Boy, even though it doesn't actually benefit him. So it's kind of at the end, kind of like um, the director kind of questions that himself by se- like having Johnny Boy being like. You're not doing this for me. You're basically doing this because you're banging my sister, which is kind of obviously cousin. your cousin. I apologize, cousin. Uh, kind of like the undertone because that makes sense. That's how it usually works. You like help out your, you know, significant other's family when they're in trouble. Like kind of just like a thing. So it's kind of like the director or Scorsese being like, yeah, realistically speaking. He can be trying to do all these like altruistic things to like, kind of like redeem himself, but there's also definitely some over undertones of you know, some personal vendetta that he has to deal with and acknowledge. I kind of think that's part like that's kind of like a bait and switch though, because you come into it like as soon as you figure out that like Teresa's his cousin, that's like you think you've like found your answer, right? Because all along like this whole movie, you're thinking like, so why is this guy? helping Johnny Boy is literally only hurting him and Johnny Boy is not getting any better so why is he spending all this time with him and hanging out with him and so like you see Teresa and so you're like okay this must be it he's with Teresa so he wants to help out Johnny Boy but then we find that Teresa doesn't even like Johnny Boy she's says fuck him basically so he can't be doing it for her sake yeah and also like further it's like Teresa kind of comes with their own subset of problems, right? Like, yeah, exactly. And he even doesn't even seem to really like have super strong. Like, he definitely likes Teresa, but you know, it's not. He goes back and forth on how he feels with her too, you know, with his father and everything. Mm-hmm. So I don't think, yeah, I think the Johnny Boy thing and the Teresa thing are almost like coincidental, you know. And also, of course, Johnny yeah. Boy doesn't know about him and Teresa. Yeah, well, until the end. That, that's why I, it's like important that I think it's like at the end because it's like kind of its whole setup is like, oh, maybe this is the reason why, and it's like ag- acknowledging that, but then that that is the a thing. It's like the director specifically saying like, yeah, this is a thing that he has to recognize, and that he has to recognize that he may be doing unconsciously. I don't think it's coincidental though that like they're related because they kind of both are an indulgence for him so they're both kind of on this like side of indulgence and like this area of indulgence in his life where like he has this one side that's like his basically like his job for his uncle who's like this mob boss and and sort of his way of like being a good worker and moving up and being an adult and all of this sort of thing and basically being an adult and making smart decisions for himself and then he has this other side of things which is like 
hanging out with Johnny Boy and having sex with Teresa and all this stuff, which he says like several times, like this is not good for my career or like you know my long term life plans. But he does it anyway because it feels good in the short term. And then that also like bundled in with this is like the bar, which is super almost like heavy handed, right? Because it's like constantly bathed in red light, where it's like this kind of hellish, mm-hmm. uh, you know, negative. But wait, let's not go there yet because I think we still have because I kind of disagree about like what you guys are saying about this whole um why he hangs out with Johnny Boy thing. So let's stick on this for a bit and then we can go to the bar, which I do think is like a whole other crop top conversation topic, right? Mm-hmm. I think you guys are kind of missing like the main. I think it's you guys are kind of like almost overlooking the obvious here. I mean, what does Charlie do for a living, right? He's a collector, mm-hmm. and we know like we have all these things of Charlie in church. I don't think he particularly likes. You know, I don't think he particularly morally feels great about this job, right? You see him like that scene with his dad where he's like finding out that his dad like put the hit on or his uncle or whatever put the hit on this guy, right? He feels like very bad about it. Wait, uh, what, at, hit on what? He didn't hit on the guy, but what, what does he do? He basically provides an asylum for the killer, right? Whatever it was. Yeah. Wait, wait can you be more specific? Because I'm trying to remember what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, sorry. I saw the movie a while ago myself, but like there's a scene with like um, the uncle in, the, in that really nice building, and um, then he's talking to that person. I think it's the person that gets shot. Oh, no, no, shot. no. It's not, a, it's not a hit. It's the... Uh, it's saying he like, offers asylum for him. Yeah, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, he's like... Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It wasn't a hit, yeah. though. It was just a guy. So what happened is, like, somebody dissed uh, the uncle or some other high-level mob member, and then this mm. random schmuck goes out and kills the guy that did the dissing in... Because he thinks, like, oh, this will, like, basically gain me some respect because I killed some guy that disrespected the big mob boss. And then they're like, you don't want you to do this. Like, no one ever cared. Um, but I guess we're going to give you some asylum anyway, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, like, but in this scene where we got this like, close-up to Charlie's face, kind of heavy hands of, like, is that scene with Charlie like, touching the fire? He doesn't, you know, he doesn't feel good about his work. And I think... Like, through Johnny Boy, he's almost like, you know, he's like, I'm collecting for all these people, but I'm going to make sure, like, all these are probably you know, poor saps who, like, don't have the money, right? But I'm going to make sure, you know, Johnny Boy, like, basically, it's like, um, it's this sort of, like, you know, justice, right? He's like, well, I'm doing all this bad by collecting, but I'm going to make sure, you know, Johnny Boy is like, okay, he doesn't wind up like all these other poor saps who I'm collecting from. Yeah, he's you know? trying to, this is his form of redemption. This is, uh, this is like, him trying to redeem himself as... He, yeah, exactly. That's why the short, shorts, that's like part of it, but the end is like kind of questioning that by, like, or having Johnny being like, yo, it's like banging my cousin and doing this because out of like your affection for her or whatever you want to call it. And then he's I like, no, I'm doing this for you, but obviously that is a question that he had to ask. I don't know. I think that the only weakness with this. Because I, I agree that's like that's kind of like what you – that's how I thought at first. But I think the weakness with this is like that when he's driving away and like basically trying to escape with Johnny Boy, he gets shot in the hand, right? And this hand like all throughout the movie is like this motif of like his – like what's being claimed by the redemptive fire, right? Because he's always sticking the same hand in the fire and burning himself. And, like, whenever he's fighting, he's like, oh, wait, careful, my bad hand, my bad hand. Presumably because his hand is, you know, always in pain or something from burning it or, you know, whatever else, self-flagellation he might be inflicting. Um, And the fact that he gets shot when he's trying to let Johnny Boy escape shows to me that, like, that's his punishment for helping Johnny Boy. In other words, like, his indulgence of Johnny Boy comes to fruition and he gets punished by getting shot in the hand, right? Like, if he was doing a good thing by helping Johnny Boy, that wouldn't be the act that gets him punished. Wait, no, we're not saying he's doing a good thing. We're saying he's trying to provide with himself with, like, the self-redemption, right? He thinks he's doing a good thing. Oh, yeah, no, I think so, too. Yeah, that's my point. That's his justification for what he's doing. But in reality, he's just being indulgent. Oh, yeah, sure, 100%. And that's kind of like his excuse. His narrative to himself is like, oh, I'm being such a good guy and I'm helping Johnny. But, like, in reality, Johnny's pretty much no good. There's no help in that guy. Like, nothing he ever does gives him any help. He's just a 
a curse, basically. But he's fun to be around. And I think there's almost like a strategy where um, he's always going after these like very kind of taboo things, right? It's not like he's just doing wrong like everybody else is doing wrong. Um, sorry, he being Charlie, of course. You know, he's like going after like these black girls at the time is like very frowned upon, right? He's going, obviously he's like, helping out this like Johnny boy is like, legitimately you like, said a kid of a fool and like helpless. Mm-hmm. And I think Charlie has to kind of deal with that too. And I think yeah, the only way he can do is through this religion stuff. Right. So I think like what all this kind of leads up to is like, yes, we're at, kind of having like, these mixed reasons, right? There's definitely some mixed reasons, but like all of Charlie's life is kind of this mixed reasons. And I think now segue, like, 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 I think the bar kind of like epitomizes like, kind of this jumbled, um, the jumbled thoughts of Charlie's mind. Yeah, I like that a lot because um, I kind of mentioned before how uh, the bar was kind of like on the side of like this indulgence, but I actually kind of don't entirely agree with that because I think the bar like rests somewhere in the middle. It's like not as indulgent as his relationship with Teresa or Johnny Boy, but it's also like not the, I don't hesitate to call it straight and narrow, but career focused path as his relationship with Zonko. It's kind of like some sort of middle ground. Well yeah, with the bar what the bar is is like literally the middle ground. You know, it's what normal people do, right? Is this yeah, how exactly. normal people but then kind of have and that's why Johnny was such a disruptive such a disruptive force is because even in the bar he's doing these very like abnormal things, you know, like pointing guns at people and like, you know, like buying drinks when he uh, doesn't have the money for it. And these sort of things that like, it's, I guess they kind of belong in the bar, but then there's this kind of like part of the relation that the outside world carries into the bar. I think you know, the scene with where he takes out this black woman, right? Is like the epitome of that, right? Where it seems mm-hmm. so good at the bar, you know, it's like, hey, this woman and it's like, oh, good, you know, good for you, Charlie. And then, you know, the second he leaves, right, they drive him through the streets. He's like, I, I can't do this. We got to go back. Yeah. And that, too, is basically, like, because of his, it would go against, like, his relationship with his uncle, right? Like, it yeah. would ruin his reputation and stuff like that. 100%. But, yeah, I think what the bar is, is it's, like, it kind of represents like growing up and settling in, but like even when you're settling into, it's like this very unsettled place, right? You're almost settling into the mean streets of it all, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's totally true. But it is where you settle is to the bar, and of course, this is also where a majority of Charlie's business will take place, right? Mm-hmm. This is where and that's why it always is evil for Charlie's because no one's where people settle in. It's where Charlie, quite literally, this is his career, right? Is going to these bars, collecting from these people. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so extra layer of irony or cruelty, whatever you want to call it. I think, yeah, the lights in the bar that this whole movie are like stupendous. I feel like. yeah, yeah, for sure. It just comes across as such like a dreary, skeevy place, especially like after their big party when it's kind of all like torn down and like alcohol's pouring everywhere from their like climbing on the bar, like. Jesus, or that the one day when uh, that guy is just like randomly like moaning on the bar. I think this is like the he's the guy that gets killed. Um, yeah, he, the like, guy is like climbing on the bar. Yeah, and he's just like slumped there. It's like, geez, so sorted. But and the, also the very impressive part of this is like a lot of this movie is like dark, right? Like, as in like you know, not much light. It takes place at night. These sorts of things. Mm-hmm. But you could always see what's going on you know it's yeah, not like true. one of these movies where it's like too overshadowed or anything it's the, what's yeah there's always a clear picture of what's happening it's not even like you're really missing out on anything because the point of this isn't necessarily that you're missing out but it's just that it is kind of like dark and sinister and mm-hmm. you are we are witnessing what is hidden we are not like you know it's not being hidden from us the viewer yeah exactly like we're sort of like outside of the 
physical mm-hmm. reality of how the light should be in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, but then it's, we don't even realize this as we're watching, right? That's yeah. that's the genius is that it doesn't look unnaturally lit. But even the whole, like these storefronts with these like bright blue lights that like shimmer just enough, there's really a lot popping in the background, I feel like, um, light-wise. Mm-hmm. Speaking of cool lights, there's a lot of shots when they're like um, trying to get Johnny Boy out of town and they're like all these like night shots of all of the lights on the bridge and stuff like that. So pretty. And they're like oh, in yeah, motion too. So it's like, if I remember right, like you can barely even see the bridge. You can just see these like in sequence lights that are kind of moving through the air, like as they drive past the bridge. It's pretty cool stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, it's like you get like this tour of New York and like you don't even know where you're going. And uh, yeah. it's just so great. He did a lot of great stuff with um, camera cutting too. Um, so, for example, there was one scene, I think he was talking with Teresa, and um, the scene changes, but the conversation just keeps flowing. So, like, we're in an entirely mm-hmm. new setting, um, but, like, it was just, like, the next line, or even, like, I can't remember if it was the next line, or if it was even, like, in the middle of his sentence. Um, but really, like, interesting stuff, and it was done sparingly enough that it didn't feel like it got tired. The other time that was really cool is when Teresa's changing, and for some reason, in kind of like a weird twist, she wants him to like close his eyes as she puts her clothes on. Uh, and then he's like kind of peeking through his fingers and looking at her jokingly. But mm-hmm. the camera does like all of like a sequence of very sharp cuts, and it almost mm-hmm. like and it's like focused like right on his eyes as it's doing this, and it almost seemed like some sort of uh like new wave film or something like that. It was very like out of place almost, but I liked it a lot because of the effect. Yeah, these like, I understand why like these cuts, like when he's like in the apartment and like walking through the hallways and stuff. I just think they were quite good. I didn't quite understand the point of them though. You know, like they're fun to watch. I didn't quite get it, but um, probably requires a closer viewing. Derek, you have any idea what's going on? No, I don't understand the point of that either. It seemed like Scorsese was kind of just messing around, you know, trying to figure out. Yeah, I guess it kind of added this sort of, I don't know. Sped up the movie, that's for sure. I think, uh, but, well, uh, at least in the case yeah. where he's like, at the sharp cuts when he's looking at Teresa through his fingers, it sort of adds like a, a certain aesthetic touch, because like, this is like, I guess, sort of like a very like, uh, maybe not solemn, but like aesthetic, um, peaceful, beautiful moment, like in Charlie's life, where we kind of get to be shown like why he likes spending time with Teresa, and uh, by she paying like special cool attention, girl. yeah, by paying special attention to the aesthetic quality of the shots, it like gives the whole scene more of like an aesthetic vibe, if that makes sense. Like, it seems more, like, artistic, I guess. Makes sense to me. But I understand that, but I just don't quite get, like, why these, like, showing, like, these, like, same scene, but, you know. Just, oh, that or, one. Yeah. yeah. Different locations sort of thing. I don't quite get that. But that's okay. Don't have to get everything. Well, I think I, I know. That one makes sense to me because it shows that it's, like, that's definitely the fact that it's, like, a recurring argument because they're in the middle of an argument. So it shows that, like, this is an argument they've had a lot, where they're having it in two different locations. Okay, I like that. Yeah, maybe I have to, like, actually raise that. I don't remember that being an argument. They were kind of just talking. But I see... If so, then, yeah. It's no, because it, I'm it. pretty sure it's the scene... I, my gut says it's the, it transitions into the scene where they're on the beach. Um, and they're having an argument about the apartment that she wants to move into. So it kind of shows, like, this is, like, a recurring... Thing that she's always kind of bitching about this apartment that she wants to get. Nah, 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 nah. I didn't even say it like that, Gil. I don't think it's really nah, 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 I man. I thought um, he was being a bit. I mean, he was kind of being a bit. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A bit short with her. Well, yeah, but like she's always like. Well, I mean, wasn't I really didn't understand that actually? I was kind of lost on the whole point of that. But didn't he say like many times he was like, okay, we'll get an apartment if you want an apartment, get an apartment, and she's like. I want you to talk to your uncle about it. Yeah, because it's like, okay, we'll get an apartment, but it's, it's not saying anything definite. I understand it. Yeah. She can't pay for it. What, what does she have? 
I don't know. Anyhow. The thing is, she knows he won't move in with her because, you know, where would uh, his uncle get all pissed? So. Yeah. Okay, Derek, give me a thought. What else do you want to say about this movie? Hmm. Hmm. No, I don't think like I got anything. I think you'll set it. Everything up. Okay, what would you have to say about the movie? Uh, let's see. I have a couple more things, I think. Um... There's a shot where there's like a carnival outside, uh, some like sort of street carnival, and it all of a sudden has this like shaky cam that almost seems like a home, a home movie of like this great big lit up glowing cross, um, and that was like such a gorgeous shot, which tied in nicely to the theme of like religion in this movie, but also uh, like something about the carnival seemed very like Americana esque like the carnival and the home family footage and that kind of thing. And there's a lot about, like, this movie definitely feels like a very American movie. Um, so oh, that was for kind sure. Of like a cool theme. Well, uh, what is New York like, but America, right? Yeah, or exactly. America but New York, I don't know how you want to say it. <laughs> yeah, and then, like, that American flag that they bring home for the vet and all that stuff. And then when he tries to, like, rape that poor woman, they're like, calm down, Jay, we're in America. We're in America here. And then let's see. Oh yeah, that the that, one, that scene was intense. The uh, the one kind of negative thing I think about this movie, and I think it's kind of like intentional, but I felt like Johnny was like such a tedious character. Eventually, like there was maybe one or two many scenes of like having to deal with him and him being a rascal and like. By the by, the end we get it. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I think my main problem with that was that it felt like for most of the movie there was like no build up on that, and then all of a sudden at the end it was kind of just like, oh, this is bowling to uh, a head, and this is coming to a head, and all right, I guess. Wait, stop. wait, wait. I disagree. What do you mean? There's no build up to this? Like. By there's no build up in consequence. It's not established that there's a consequence for anything that he does. For well, yeah, that's for, the point. Yeah, well, that might be the point, but I think that's a problem for actually being in, invested in like this character who's main. Wait, a consequence stick. for Johnny Boy or for Charlie? Johnny Boy. See, see, this that's is I think you're saying though. That that may be the point, but my point is that because of that. It's like, okay, he's just going to get away with it, and then maybe eventually there'll be something, but that's going to be at the end. So let me just, like, turn off my brain when it, this character shows up, and then I'll just wait till something actually happens. It's super foreshadowed, though, because, like, Michael comes in asking for money, like, in literally the first or second scene. Yeah, he I'm asks for like... money in the second scene, and then all of a sudden it's just, like, not an issue. For like an hour, hour and a half, and then that's totally not true. He comes up like there's like three or four times. Yeah, he comes up like... and is like, "Yeah, give me money," but that's not a consequence. That's just literally just asking Wait. for money. The shot like beat him up and stuff. Like they don't, don't they like, almost get into a fight. That's the big game. I like the no, no, end. before that though. No. There's like one more scene where like they like they like at the bar and like they like about to like start squirming. They kind of like throwing jabs at each other. Yeah, that was in like then... the last forty minutes, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's not that long of a movie, Derek. The last forty minutes is like. It's like an half long. movie. Well, yeah, because it like starts off like fairly cordial, like they're having drinks together, yeah, and then so, it becomes yeah. like a very like stern thing, and then eventually it boils to where like yeah, said he's an hour, hour pulling a half. gun on Michael. Well, because then we also have this character of Michael, right? Who is the young guy too? You know, is and he's literally just asking Johnny uh, for money. Uh, no, I think Michael. No, that's not true. See, there's a lot. He's like a lot of subtle character development, right? Like we get this scene like where he's like, yeah, look at this girl I'm trying to get with, and she's, this guy's like, dude, you know, like she was like totally like banging this black dude, you know. It's like, uh, and he's like not taken seriously, right? And um, it's kind of hinted at throughout, and until of course you know Johnny basically says it like, you know, you're the only jerk off who would still take my money because 
it's almost like the reason that it has to like escalate as quickly as it does in terms of like consequences, right? Where it's not like and he beats up Johnny Boy and then he goes to shoot him. It's is because Michael almost this is almost like this is like very important for Michael, right? That he can kind of get this first almost like punishment, right? That he can kind of establish himself as like someone to actually be taken seriously. I do think Michael is like a serious character as well. It's just one that's like more subtly developed. Well, it's also like not like he goes from like threatening to shooting with skipping beating up because he yeah, did yeah. try to go beat up Johnny Boy and then Johnny Boy pulled a gun on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. Although that was like less, you know, it wasn't like really like uh, go try to beat him up. It was kind of like jumping across the table. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it was more I like mean, an act of anger than like a cool act of like. That's still quite towards the end. And my point is that that may be intentional, but that's not going to keep me invested for like an hour, hour and whatever. Okay, Derek, I feel like you're being, the movie is like not that, it's like an hour, 40 minute movie, right? You're invested for the first 20 minutes, but the fact that he does it well. Like, a lot of this middle stuff is, you know, um, it's like, there's like romance, or I guess, you know, you can kind of argue if it's... Well, it's an it's hour and 52 minutes. <laughs> so, almost two hours. Okay. And, and the last sure. 30 minutes is where he, Johnny Boy, yeah. actually has to face consequences. So you're like so a, my point is that because of that, I'm, but that hour in between, I literally don't care about the scenes where he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna pay you back," and then. I mean, I sort of, I sort of see what you're saying. That like, you know, he's not gonna pay him back. Yeah. So like, it kind of like becomes like a tiresome. It's like, it's kind of like it's kind of tiresome. It's like. Exactly. Like. But see, this is why I disagree. Is because. I don't think those scenes are about Johnny Boy. You know. I mean, maybe, he's, but he's in them. Okay. Sure, but then they finish. These things are about Charlie, right? So the issue is Johnny Boy doesn't really like care about anybody, right? So yeah, it's like he's kind of a tedious character to get invested in them, but we're not really supposed to get invested in them. We're supposed to get frustrated with them, right? And and if you do get invested in them, it's because of his relationship with Charlie, right? Because for every annoying Johnny Boy scene, we also get like these like fun Johnny Boy scenes where he's like messing around with Charlie, you know, fighting with trash cans, these sorts of things. Um well, this is one Johnny Boy scene I really like to question you guys about later but um and but we see like the looks on charlie's faces as like johnny boy continues to not pay right and he continues to just be like this you know in his own words a jack off right uh who's being johnny boys and i think that's where the pain comes from is because it's not about like the tension mounting on johnny boy because right there the tension doesn't really mount on johnny boy ever right it's the point of johnny boy but the tension mounting on charlie I mean, perhaps, but the point is about Johnny Boy, not Charlie. I don't understand. What, what is your point? I already said the point. Okay, that what, what is your qualm? Pretty much what Caleb already said, except for probably a little bit more, but that he's just a tedious character, and the scenes that he's in is kind of just tedious. <laughs> okay, but it's like, he can be a tedious character without the scenes he's in being tedious, and this is my point, right? I think they're the same. As a character... No, it's, it's not. This is not true. Uh, in a scene with two people, for hypothetically, if one of them is already someone I've established that I've not invested in and I find tedious, the scene with is... With two people? I'm hypothetically speaking about two but people, but like, I'm going to set up... I'm going no, to... Yeah, I'm going to set up... Mean? Okay, one second. I'm going to say Charlie oh, and Johnny Boy. I'll give you a specific scene then. I, it doesn't fucking matter. Yes. All right. He's talking to Johnny Boy in the car, and he's like, "Eh, gotta pay some money, Johnny." Like that's a tedious scene. Whatever. And all the other scenes where it's just Charlie and Johnny Boy being like, "You're a fuck up, Johnny," et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> There's like five. Like of how them. many of these scenes are? There's like five. Of them. Not that many. Well, what are these? I do kind of feel like there are like a lot of scenes of like. Charlie trying to get Johnny Boy to pay. Yeah, there's that literally five of them. After every time that his uncle's like, uh, you need to stop fucking around with Johnny Boy, there's a following scene where he's fucking around with Johnny Boy, and then every time he has to talk <laughs> to the, like, Michael or whatever, he's like, I need him to pay. There's a scene following of Charlie being like, Johnny, you gotta pay. <laughs> I don't think this is, like, accurate, though. I, it I is like accurate. Like, I... You can like, scan through the movie, and it'll... Within, so, like, like five, exactly. five to I'll ten minutes... TVs. Within like, so it can't, like five to yeah. ten minutes, it'll be the exact. It'll, it'll be like another scene with Johnny and Charlie, and maybe one or two other people. I feel like they're 
are not that many with just Johnny and Charlie, right? We have the one like long we talked about, right? Where it's like um. That but regardless, that wasn't the point. That was just a hypothetical of. Let me say, if like five hundred okay, but... people, if like I'm invested with only one of them, that we've said that uh, Charlie's like we're supposed to be invested in, then the scene is not going to be as fun as if I'm invested with the other people as well. It's not a dynamic scene. Wait, what? No, that's not true. This is like you just literally make up definitions. I mean, you can have dynamic scenes not, where you're only invested in one person. Where I'm interested it's, in like the interaction dynamic between means character them. change. Eh, dynamic okay, means there's character change. Dynamic. dynamic means change. Alright, fine. <laughs> you, I don't mean dynamic in that way, but fine. Uh, interesting, enjoyable scene where I'm invested in what is happening and what is the interaction means for the all the characters and etc, etc, etc. I.e. it's a tedious scene. What about Flowers of the Last Chrysanthemums? Wait, no, right. Or, that or, or, was a hell of a movie. Because I feel like these, like, Mean Street scenes, like, I feel like you're not giving enough credit to, like, the other characters' movie. I think, like, all the characters are, like, very engaging. I'm not talking like, about the other characters. Like... I've only mentioned Johnny Boy as tedious, but we can continue to talk <laughs> about each individual character if you would like. Okay, sure, but you're saying Johnny Boy is tedious, which makes a scene with Johnny Boy and tons of other people tedious. I don't understand how that makes sense. I think Michael is an interesting character. I have, like, talk about how I think he is, like, certainly dynamic. Yes, think... Johnny Boy is not dynamic because, like, by definition, he's not dynamic. Like, he cannot be dynamic. That is the point of Johnny Boy. He is like the not dynamic. I don't think that makes it less interesting to think you have to deal with this character, Mike, who is very dynamic, who is trying to struggle with Johnny Boy, who is not dynamic. Right. And I think you're saying that like it's tedious, but I think I just saying the circumstances around all of these scenes are always different, right? It's not like you're making something like this pattern of like this, this, this. It's not a pattern, right? There's always a different scene before and after these like um Johnny Boy doesn't pay Michael scenes, right? It's sometimes it's um you know, these scenes with Giovanni, right? Sometimes it's these scenes with, like, Charlie and Teresa. Like, there's a like, different scene surrounding these Johnny boy scenes, which is why it's not to use, because it's, like, adding different things to, like, how Charlie's supposed to feel. So, I've already mentioned that after every scene with his uncle, there's a Johnny Boy scene, etc., etc. It's not a I can literally name scenes with his uncle where there aren't Johnny Boy yeah. scenes. Yeah, it, I, irregardless, I, it, I, even if the scenes I, in between and after or whatever the fuck, I, it doesn't even matter. The point isn't that those scenes aren't interesting. The, scene, the point is that the scenes with Johnny Boy, because he's a tedious character, are tedious. But no, even no, then, no, I'm not saying so, just all scenes that he's in. I'm saying literally where I have to be seeing him interacting and the point is like the interaction with him those scenes are tedious which I do not think is that crazy of an idea I don't think it's true that like if there's a tedious character in the scene that makes the scene tedious that makes the interaction tedious it is only tedious if it is two tedious characters right because then we're kind of stuck with like uh, nothing happening right there is no dynamic but there is dynamics right because Michael is getting more pissed and Charlie needs to figure out like, continues to figure out ways to, like, promise Michael, and it's like, you can see it build up on him. Yeah, well, I already know that's going to happen, because Johnny Boy is a tedious character that I know what's going to happen. What's that mean? He, it, but how it's, can you predict others' reactions because one character is tedious? I don't understand this. Because it's obvious. Characters. If Johnny Boy is not going to pay, then that Michael's going to get angrier, then Charlie's going to have to deal with that. He's going to have to find ways to deal with that, and then Paris is going to be mad, because she's not whatever but 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 and whatnot it's like if because of this tedious character the interaction is not going to be as interesting because i know what's going to happen with regard to johnny boy and since he's a vehicle for a lot of the con like actual movement of charlie's like narrative it a lot of the scenes end up being tedious specifically speaking because it seems to be a thing the one where he has to interact with johnny boy I guess I just feel like this is really weird logic. So if you have a static character, that, I just wish I'm like, why is the character is static? That means that like any scene involving them is like worse now. I wouldn't say like any scene, but 
at the very least in the ones that presented in this movie are. Well, I guess it's also frustrating because I feel like you're like not actually referencing like, I don't know. We should probably move on, but I just feel like this is kind of like an accurate representation of what's happening, especially because you weren't really referencing like once you said it's seeing them in a car, which I'm not even one hundred percent sure what scene you're talking about, because the only scene I remember them in a car, like that taxi scene where they're not really talking about this money stuff. They're in cars like two times. Yeah, <laughs> two times. I'm so not sure exactly what you're talking about, but let's move the, on. the exact same scene, so it's fine. Okay, see, this is what I mean. You're like using this like. Yeah, okay, whatever. Let's talk about story of the last Chris Anthems. Gail about to go to the gym. What do you guys think of this movie? Uh pretty good movie. Like uh really good cinematography. Uh compelling characters. Uh this movie definitely has a lot of the Thing that you like where we see through things or like through buildings or oh, yeah there was like some like vertical slats like a railing or something yeah yeah i was gonna to... mention that shot yeah mm-hmm. so there's a lot of cool things he did with like tracks and stuff and like tracking shots but that one specifically was really good but i'll start with like the first one that i saw but just like we see like the dressing room of the actors at the back of the stage and we see the stairs from the dressing room into the stage and then like the back of the stage and you even see a bit of the audience so you can see the angle of where the audience are sitting like you have so much idea of the space that it was really good and then we obviously get the soon after is the shot of them like carousing or whatnot at the geisha place and then the shot starts with like the those people, the fellow actors and the geishas shit-talking Iku, who's standing on an adjacent balcony, and the shot is through the slats looking at them, and it tracks across the building, and you see the entire layout of the building. So the, uh, like, a balcony on, like, I guess the west side, if and this is the starting shots on the south side, I guess, I don't know. Different perpendicular angles, I guess. Doesn't matter. And then, it was just like, so obviously he's hearing what they're saying. It was just like cool. <laughs> a funny setup for that, especially because the geisha immediately comes in and starts like, ah, "You're so great." <laughs> what I liked about I think it was that scene, um, is that the way that they use, um, they the way they like set up the characters in their conversation is like super smart and it they'll usually find a way to show off, like, everyone's face at the same time, even when that would, like, not normally be um, doable, like, in a realistic conversation. And I, to kind of, ref, like, reference another movie, when we watched, um, uh, what was that movie called last week? With the uh, Germany Year Zero. Oh, yeah. We specifically mentioned how, like, the blocking of the characters looked, like, really awkward and unnatural. And I think that that was because it was, like, it would make sense if you were having an actual conversation with people, but it wouldn't really it doesn't make sense like from a movie standpoint. And I think this is like the opposite of that. It's like setups of conversations that would not make very much sense in real life, but they work so well, like in the movie and in the shot that it's like so easily excusable. Especially because they're very reminiscent of like um like theater. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, this is a movie about theater that, like, it kind of works on like several different levels. And what I mean is that I think it was in this geisha conversation where the main character is like, he's trying to like turn his face away from the people that are talking, and there's like two girls that are having a conversation, and he's like turning his face away. But they always set it up to where like he's turning his face away from them, but towards the camera. And then we get to see the two other people that are both facing at least like 75% towards the camera as they're having a conversation with each other. Um, and it's just like so smart and effective of, so that you get to see everyone's facial expressions like all the time. Yeah, and it's very fast at developing like characters and like their motivations. Is like, uh, specifically I noticed that in like the scene with um, Kika's brother, whose name I forgot to write down. 
Um, oh, it was Fuku. Uh, it was Fuku. Um, but um, yeah, Fuku is talking to um, Mo Mojita. I'm going to butcher that. Um, but the uh, like the head actor dude or whatever that works with his um, Kiku's father, and he's like, we should give Kiku a chance. And it's like you see, even though he's looking at the dude who's facing the car uh, camera, is like you see Fuku's face. And you can see, mm -hmm. like, him actually care. It was great, because it's, like, you can see his actual care for Kiku in that moment. And <laughs> and it was, like, I don't know. It was really effective for me. It was, like, oh, this is an actual character other than Otaku who cares about Kiku. <laughs> it's, like, this is the first one that we've seen so far, really, that it seems this way. Mm -hmm. Is it Otaku or Otoku? Otoku. I... Talk about it. It's an character. Otaku. We'll get to that later. Yeah, otaku would be incorrect. That would, that's a different thing. Otoku. I uh, apologize. But okay. I really uh, liked also this mm -hmm. uh, shot towards the beginning where uh, otaku and uh, kiku are like walking together. Yes. And there's like a growing amount of space between them. Like I can't remember who's ahead. I think it's like kiku's ahead, but like she kind of lags behind, and so they kind of like almost like stretch out on the screen. And then eventually, like, come back together. And it's a cool way of, like, showing the emotional or social distance between them that can grow and shrink, like, as time passes. Yeah, because as he talks to her, he realizes how real she is. And as she, like, talks to him and, like, tells him, like, how bad his act acting actually is, he's obviously, because this is, like, the first person that's ever done that, he's, like, gaining a real connection to this actual person that's actually saying honest words to him. Mm -hmm. And then I... it's like the shot also is really good because it's like upward from the river mm -hmm. that we see later. So it's kind of like already setting up. Oh, this is where the people are going to be watching the river from. And it's like oh, I didn't even catch that. That's cool. So it's like an upward angle from that. So this is kind of like a foreshadowing of that. There were quite a few upward angled shots in this movie. I, yeah, they're really cool. Going back to what you were saying earlier, Caleb, about, like, this, like, these, like, sh shots, like, with the theater, like, how the theater kind of, how they do these shots. Mm hmm I think this is, like, actually, like, a very critical kind of point, frankly, the theme of this is, um... These shots at the beginning are supposed to, and I haven't quite figured out why this is, but these shots at the beginning are supposed to remind you of the theater, right? It's supposed to be like almost like these theatrical shots. Exactly. Um, like there's all these kind of hints to it too. Um, like the scene with like him at the brothel. It's like it's lit well and it's blocked like very well, like kind of like oddly well. You know, what I mean? like it's. Like lit, like almost like it's like lit for a play, right? Like it would never be lit like in real life, you know? Yeah. Um, give me one sec, guys. Yeah, one second. But yeah, it would never be lit like this in real life. Um, another scene that like, really describes me in this way is actually kind of a cute little reference is it's when she is um he's going to like. Her house, I think, like he's trying to like meet me up with the Tokyo, and like she doesn't come out because like her parents won't let her, right? But there's this really cool part where like there's this flag or something, um, and they like you see someone come out, and it's almost just like a stage hand, it's like taking the flag out of the scene, like literally no explanation, like who this girl really even is. I still don't quite understand, it's like this banner, and then like the scene kind of gets dark, and then it um it goes on and continues with, like two different characters, right? Like same area, but two different characters. And so these little things, like, yeah, it's definitely supposed to be, like, a play. Yeah, it's really clever, because, like, it doesn't necessarily, like, it's there if you, like, are looking for it or, like, paying really close attention, but it doesn't, like, it's not beaten in too much, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think it definitely, I mean, I wouldn't say that. I think it's definitely beaten in enough, right? Like, because also, conversely, towards the, as the movie goes on, the second half of the movie, you get, like, these very, like, cinematic shots, right? Like, I think... Mm -hmm. I'm stepping on one of you guys' point here, but um, you have this 
scene with Otoku and she's like very dimly lit. Yes, I was going to mention that. Yep. Yeah, like all these shadow effects. Um, which is like really, obviously like insanely cinematic. Yeah. I was going to mention that um, we've already seen at this point that she's kind of sick, but the camera slows down a lot and then like stops like following her perfectly at this point because she's moving mm -hmm. really slow and the camera moves like even slower as she like goes through the building where like it eventually it gets to the point where when she crosses into the next room it doesn't actually follow her until like a little bit later it lingers like <laughs> like she's so sick that the camera gets sick as well for like, sure and it's such no, a really do like that shot. and also like all these you almost have almost like these mirroring things where it's like all these scenes towards the beginning are like outside or like in these like open spaces, right? Because not necessarily outside, but like in these open spaces, because like if it was like a theater production, right? Like they obviously have to be like out in somewhat open spaces, you know? Um, you can't like be too intimate because like when you're watching a play, it's not that intimate, right? Um, but then, so for instance, when he's getting confronted before he leaves to Osaka, that's the name of the city? Osaka. Going, oh, I think. Osaka. Osaka, um, he's being confronted outside of the train station, right? But then we get a scene about the same like um, time, I guess, like uh, reflected on the second half of the movie where he's being confronted within a train because now that we're cinematic, we can be in trains before the intimacy here. It's a very close up, congested. Oh. Sort of Whereas um, the train station's more crowded. So yeah, they almost do like, these direct comparisons. The shot That's of him really outside cool. the train was also really interesting. Because it's through the train on him on, like, the train walkway. So it just, like, it follows him as he walks down looking for Otoku in the train. And we scan the train as well with him. Hmm. Now, I noticed you guys are talking about all these shots and stuff. And I'm going to kind of move on because <laughs> I think the shot, the shooting and, like, these sorts of things, like, the themes, um, like, I guess like the more like typically directorial work is where I think a lot of my confidence in this movie ends. I think it definitely has quite a few weaknesses as well. Um, particularly, I guess I'll be frank with it. I think the dialogue kind of corny. I'm actually incredibly corny. Um, I don't know who actually wrote the movie. Do you guys know? Nope. I can look it up. It is not by him. It's by. Three dudes. Uh, it's based upon a novel by Shofu Muromatsu and is written by two other dudes. Matsuro, yeah, Matsu Toro. Kawagachi and Gucci um, and Yoshikata Yoda. <laughs> I can't believe his last name's Yoda. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so not written by him, but still, like, I think this dialogue was corny. I don't think it's acting, like, I'm talking about how great acting was not just a shame. Definitely not here for this movie. Wait, really? I thought the actor for Kiku was really good. Yeah. I thought Kiku, he was not good at all. Kiku and Otoku, or, I would say Otoku <laughs> especially was also really good. No, she was bad, dude. Really? Come on. And we're going to talk about these tedious freaking characters. There's no way you can say this girl was anything but the most tedious character. What? You thought she was tedious? What? Yeah. She's just tedious in a nice way instead of tedious in a Johnny Boy asshole way. She's oh, yeah. saying, how is <laughs> it's so tedious? Like, I don't but know. There's, there's, like, there's, like, there's a difference between like static and tedious. Because tedious is unpleasant, but static, you can be pleasant in a static way. He's like, but she okay, is it's set up tedious but... in that. Uh, if Derek's saying definitely tedious is that you can predict their actions, right? They're predictable, not just static, but like in the unchangeable, predictable, right? Because you can be static and still unpredictable. Well, yeah, but. His problem is that he's, like, static and, like, he never has any consequences even though he's an asshole, which is, like, his main character flaw. And then this character he's flaw what? is completely static and so on and so forth. And then just, like, j jarring because you know what's going yes, to happen, what he's going to cause, the mm -hmm. like, and whatnot, and these other characters, and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter. The problem, uh, the thing that is good about her being static is that for Kiku, the problem in his life is that literally everyone is fake. And that's, like, set up immediately from the start. And then it's this like rock of like actual honest human being who just like cares and wants him to better himself comes and is like honestly there for him and like that staticness of her personality is like what he needs I oh i see so because, though, because wait really quick uh, so you're just saying 
it's not tedious because actually Caleb, you can go first. I'll make a point after. Uh, I'm, I was just gonna say that I think it goes deeper than that though, because even though like you could make the argument that she doesn't make any like dramatic swinging changes, she does have some subtle uncertain like she doesn't change necessarily, but we're not always certain who she is in her unchangingness. Yeah. And what I mean by this is that there's sometimes where like she might say that um like it was that it was that time when like she uh her she wrote the letter, right? Saying like basically I don't remember the specifics, but it was like basically like I don't want to be with you, go on without me, right? And it was like after after he became successful. So she was saying, go on, have your career, um, and this is where we separate, right? And but we don't know, like, does she actually feel this way and she wants to separate from him because he's been a bit of an asshole to her for the past five years? Or is she does she actually miss him? Like, what's her true intentions, right? And then, of course, we find out that she really does love him and she's really sad that she had to say goodbye, but she's basically doing it to help further his career. Uh, but, uh, we find out, like, why was that ever up, up in the air that she loved him and she won with his first career? I'm confused. Because up until this, this is like the whole, the next point, right? Because up until this point, she's been entirely honest, right? Like, that's her whole shtick, is that she always tells the truth. And she was being so, honest here, too. Mm, I don't think so. No, well... What she said was dishonest. <laughs> it's a shades of meaning kind of thing, right? Because, and that's what makes it interesting. Because she says this letter that she's like, I no longer want to be with you, you'll make me happier by leaving. But would he really make her happier by leaving? And that's where it gets hazy, right? Because, like, on the one hand, she does want to see him succeed. And so he has to go on his own to succeed. So him being on his own makes her happier. But on the other hand, she really, really loves him and wants to be with him. So being apart from him makes her sad. So there's, like, this duality to it where, like, which way is she actually happier? And I'm not sure if even she knows, right? But it's this point where, like, even though she's not making any, like, dramatic character changes, we're not always sure, like, what her, like, what the nature of her actually is. I don't understand. Like, I, re- I just don't understand what point you're confused, right? Because, like, it just feels like we do know the nature of her. her she wants, literally, her whole character is that she wants what's best for her husband, right? Or, I guess, I will be the husband. She wants best for Kiku, right? That is, like, her whole character the entire time. Literally, her purpose of the entire movie is wants plus for Kiku. To the point where he's literally beating her, and, like, we don't even really see, like, a true emotional ramification. We see her crying for 10 seconds, and then they're, we literally go straight to another scene where they are, like, back to, essentially coming with each other, and she's, which is followed by a scene where she's immediately supportive of him, right? Literally, her whole character is support Kiku, support Kiku, support Kiku. And I think it's kind of funny that you guys are saying the reason that she's not as, um, a teenage character is because she's really bringing out the best in Kiku, when this is literally my exact point about Johnny Boy and Charlie, is that that is why Johnny Boy is just, just not a TD's character, and it's because he brings out the best in Charlie. Except for he brings really out the worst in Charlie. But we're, you can't go back to Main Streets. We're already on to the left. Yes, we can't. Right the, the whole point is the comparison between the two. I don't understand. I'm asking you. Using your logic in Main Streets, how is she not tedious? Because nothing is said has made her not... I don't... I mean, I guess... I really also, understand your point, she, Caleb. The only thing because she's, also, uh, it's kind of unfair really quick, to say can I that... Address oh, Caleb's yeah. point. I just want to address Caleb's point real quick, Derek, and then you can go. All right. Because, Caleb, I feel like if this was really supposed to be this big, like, contemplative thing, we would have gotten more with her as a big contemplative thing, right? Like, this is past the point of, like, play, right? This is, like, pure cinema. We can... But we do. We get, we get lots of scenes with that effect, right? This specific one is after... Um, he has his big successful play like in the medium sized city, and then she like can't even like watch him perform, right? And she's like literally like praying or anything thing because on the one hand she wants him to be successful, but on the other hand, him being successful means that they'll have to separate, right? So there's this like conflict within her, which makes her there's never any conflict in Johnny Boy. There's and, conflict in this character. And that's why at the end, when she's, like, finally accepted by Kiku's father, that's, like, a really happy moment for her. Because, obviously, she's held this belief that she wanted to be his legitimate wife, and she wanted to be with him in a very real sense, like, as a wife, not just as, like, 
the woman supporting him as like you know et cetera, et cetera as that role as just like the woman that supports him he wants to be like his wife like legitimate yeah, like, and that's like a, and even further like having wants like is more than johnny boy has having what having a want like johnny boy, doesn't johnny want boy has wants he no, just wants to have a good time she wants to make her husband happy they literally have a single want there's no want no. yeah what, what are her other wants I said but, one, but like just right just now. Described. Oh yeah, I guess like for her father accept him, but isn't that really just so she can be with him, thus she can make him happy? No, I mean, because her wants really... are at no, because she literally okay. has multiple wants Sir. that are at odds with she, each other. She has she has one want where she wants her husband to be successful. She has another want where she wants to be with her husband. She has another want where kind of a subset of that want. Yes, you're right that she wants to be recognized as a legitimate wife to her husband. In so the rest, like, but not kind of yeah. It's. Things, continue. But regardless, at the least, she has two separate wants that are at odds with each other. And that's, like, interesting. And Kiku Which is maybe obviously... even more than Kiku has. Yeah, and actually, sure, but... Kiku he's... also has similarly two conflicts in that he ultimately, he knows that like, Otoku is the reason why he's as good as he is, and like, is the reason why he's being bettered. So he, like, feels he needs her in, like, uh, both a romantic way and in a literal, like, kind of you know, pragmatic way. And then the conflict is that obviously, there. This is kind of like a uh, star cross lovers thing, I guess. But like, they have to stay separate for him to be like an excess ex success and to better himself as an actor in his like actual literal career path. So I feel it would be also unfair to say that Kiku is like one note. I mean, she, just because she has multiple things, she's still, we always know what she's going to prioritize, right? I mean, you guys can say that, like, maybe she's, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, these wants that are, um... Except for that's a good thing in her case. That's a positive, like, trait that makes her endearing as a character. See her be, like, the only person for Kiku, even though, and be, like, a steadfast, like, support and honest, like, you know, honestly caring for him. No okay, but see, now you guys, here, here's the thing, is you guys are acting like Kiku is his character who we like throughout the entire time, right? Kiku is a character I think that, at least the first of this movie, we really don't like that much. No, I'm not saying that, that it's She's not... She's liked from pretty much the first moment we see them two together. Yeah, and it's set up, I think that's, like, why it's important that he's set up as, like, the outcast of his family. He's, like, you know, downtrodden, and but yet everyone builds him up just because his father's great. To be also a great actor behind his back, though they like shit on him all the time, and that's why it's important that Otoku comes and is like you know honestly caring about him. So it's kind of like yeah, uh, they kind of reinforce each other that way. So like his positive traits and her positive traits are brought to the surface. And we have romantic oh, scenes between them from like the very first scene that they're shown together. So, and that was like at least in the first twenty minutes of the movie. So yeah. I don't know, like, what your point Actually, is. That... What is. What is romantic scenes? I'm saying, you're saying she's endearing and, like, like what a Kiku, but, like, I don't know why that's a positive trait when Kiku is a character that we don't like. And then she's actually, like... like Who doesn't like I Kiku? I don't like Kiku. What is there to like about it? What does he do positive with the entire first part of the movie? He's considered a bad actor who has, like, basically been spoiled his entire life, and he's given everything he wants and, like, praised tons to his face. Sure, he's talked behind his back, but, like, this never seems to affect him. He gets to the point where he is, like... He takes his wife on like a very selfish like, journey where he ends up beating her, which, by the way, is like literally never actually touched on seriously, and is like she literally goes right after supporting. Him. We don't get any sort of like emotional like ramifications of this. That's like, that's a well. That I think is important as like it reinforces her as like a character that is honestly, too nice for her own kid. No, honestly, yeah, and which is a po both a positive trait and a negative trait in that this is like oh no, oh, she's too nice for her own good. That's that's gonna be the death of her, and it's literally the death of her. And it's kind of like, I don't know. It's thematically important less than like the actual like character of Kiku, Kiku wise. He's kind of like a vehicle for that in that regard. Yeah, exactly. And I think if I think Kiku does have some positive qualities because like he basically gets praised by everyone, but he desires to become an talented actor in his own right like he's not content to like ride the coattails of this praise and be famous just for being famous sake. like he has a desire to like make a genuine craft 
And he's shown, and like, positively that, so... when he's, like, talking to, like, the... Like, when the other people are, like, talking to, like, the lessers or, like, the actual, like, kitchen people and whatnot, they seem like dicks. And it's, like, a scene where we see, like, Kiku, like, helping them out and shit like that. Which, I don't know. It was, as a little scene at oh, the beginning, Kiku. it helped, like, I don't know, make me like him a bit more. I just feel like he's still, like... As far as he's like a likable character, I think we also get these scenes of him like literally in a brothel, which is not exactly a place where like our most well, respectable this, characters go. Well, in but, this and, period, that's what actors do. That's like, and also in this time, being like going to see a courtesan or a geisha and whatnot is like an actual thing that men do. That's like a good thing. That's like a show of status and shit like that. Sure, but he's also kind of being like a jerk to like these geishas, and I, I still don't think like because it's. Like, or respectable for these rich men to do it. It's not like we necessarily like, like the rich because. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't. It's, it's not even being like, not a like, negative like, trait at this time. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's being like an ass. Okay, right. at this time, at the, I mean, at the time of. The film takes place on at the time of the making of the film, which are different things, right? Yeah. But um, also, like, I don't think. Um, what was I saying? He's not even nice to these geishas, though, right? He's like an asshole to them, too. Well, yeah, but they're also being assholes to him. Like, yeah, we only, I don't think he's even being an asshole. He's just getting exasperated at their duplicitousness. Yeah, he is literally shown that they're ju- the geisha who comes in literally just shit talking him, and he heard. That's why he was like so like nonchalant and just like, why are you talking to me? I know you're real. Like, what do you really think about me? He, it was specifically we talked about. <laughs> that was like the first thing we talked about is that that shot. We see him and hear them. Yes, I don't know. I guess I just don't think like I just don't understand like where he's redeemed until. You get towards the end, even then he's like still like emotionally. I feel like he's another one of these characters who never really does anything actually that good, right? He's just things that are like not bad, I suppose. Hmm. Outside of like some like kind of nice things to Otoku, which is like kind of seems like a joke because she's just so incredibly nice to him. And once again, I just feel like once again we don't ever get the emotional ramifications of these moments, right? Like you can say with Mean Streets, sure Johnny Boy is tedious, but we're going back to Charlie every single well, time. The emotional right? ra- ramification Shorter. is that he, she literally dies for, for because of his her basically her sacrifice and love for him. I guess, but see, and this one thing, this whole thing seems like so corny and like tired. Of this, you know, it's like it doesn't feel like this whole thing of like she dies for love and she gets exhausted. Like this has literally been done several times before, like, even before this moment, let alone before like you know, before whatever, like it was nineteen thirty nine or something. Let alone before, you know, as of now, it just doesn't seem like it's not this dynamic of a storyline and like one that I feel was very obvious. No, I didn't think it was obvious at all. Like, I had no idea if he was going to be successful by the end. I thought there was a good chance. Yeah, it, so that he was going to end up like dying in obscurity. That's the that's like the thing. It's like that's kind of like the subversion is that there's both the success and like you know his success and her death and like just opposed like. And the way he gets that success is through basically her death. So it's kind of like, you know, there's a, like, kind of a really complex conflict there where he has to deal with the fact that he's a success and, you know, he's out on the parade for his wife. Is that complex of a conflict? I think it is. Like, the fact that he has to make it sound It's super bittersweet. Yeah, it's definitely very bittersweet. Something complex, though. There's nothing like there, substance wise. Okay, fine. I'll use a different word then. It's a conflict. (laughs) <laughs> there's no like I don't know I just feel like this movie is like so hung up, hung up on like one word I use and it's kind of I don't know it, 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 it's whatever I feel like you guys are really saucing this whole thing up like she's like uh, I just don't think either of them are like that compelling at all like I really and I you know I think there's a lot of things compelling about the movie I don't think like these two characters are like necessarily it I think once again like these shots are amazing like what he's doing with this whole like relation of like play to the movie as to like how time goes by i think you can talk about like emotion versus plot these sorts of things are very interesting i don't think like this narrative is like that or these and especially these characters are like the hell to die on especially these, this or you're the one that brought it up gosh. and we're just showing our point of view on it yeah i just feel like you guys are really defending this one. i don't know but anyways continue yeah because we liked it and you didn't like it yeah, that's why story. we're saying well, it. the story was pretty good because okay. like 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 i mentioned before there's this like conflict of like and like i haven't seen this represented at least as well before 
of this conflict of like when you love so oh I don't even know how I could describe it. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, she like literally wait, like if you want someone to like you know go away from you and do their own thing, but you also love them, like are you lying when you say you want them to go? Like, you know, like is she was she lying in that letter? Like she obviously like was in conflict about it and didn't want him to leave her. She wanted him to stay and wanted him to uh, be her husband. But on the other hand, she really did want him to go and be successful. So, like, I don't know, there's conflict there, and I think that's a pretty interesting conflict to make a movie about. Yeah, and it's wrapped up very well at the end, because he literally, his success is paraded, and she dies for his success, And he, <laughs> but he also does the parade pretty much for her. He's very willing to just give it all up for her. Yeah, but all, it's not, like, the most, like, tragic scene ever, though, when, like, he leaves her deathbed to go join the parade, and it's like, dude, are you really gonna do this? Are you yeah. gonna leave her in her dying moments to go be paraded? But on the other hand, we know like, that that's what do you what do in wants. that situation? Because that she's, like, literally begging you to. So, like, what do you do in that situation? Like, like I don't know. That's, like, I if I was in that situation, like, what would you do? Like, would you say no, no, no to your, like, I'm gonna be with you because it's important to be with you, like, in your dying breath? Or do you go because you know that's what's gonna make her happier? Like. That's like I don't know. I felt that it was pretty powerful. I feel like you guys like I guess really had a different read of the movie than I did. I feel like this whole second half of the movie is like once again is like the play versus cinema. It's about like the emotion of the play, right? Versus like this kind of uh, kind of because the play it's like you can see anything, right? But the cinema it's like it's pointed to something, and I think it's kind of the whole point of the second half of the movie is that it's all about you know as you grow older you don't really have a choice, right? You kind of just do what you must and like this kind of things like this you know the spontaneous love it's not going to get you more so i mean i don't think this is really necessarily about the choice like as this big more ethical thing i think it's about like boy it's spontaneous love does get him somewhere it literally makes him a successful actor and brings him yes but not as you grow older right as is which is what i'm saying like this as when you're younger you have like this whole world of possibilities and you can be spontaneous and you can yeah which is which does right but yeah, that's it's, why it's shown that uh, he has to go to his family and whatnot, and he ultimately does need help. That's why Fuku says that. Fuku's, yes. That's why it's important that it's shown that Fuku actually cares about him, because when Fuku says that, that he needs people's help, it's actually, you know, we know it's an honest thing. It's like, this is coming from an actually caring place for him. This is the reality he has to face. But that's obviously another conflict in relation to O2. Otoko's, uh, Otoku's relationship with Kiku. But yeah, like I was saying, like, I think this movie, it's like half the movie's about, like, you kind of just have to do what life needs of you, right? Like, and he wasn't going, I think it's, like, not a coincidence that he can't even go to Otoku until his father tells him to, right? And, like, he's kind of just doing things people tell him to because, like, this is what you have to do at a certain point. You can't, like, be young and rebellious and, like, you, know, you can't make the choice to like I just want to be a better actor now you have to kind of go with what your younger self has been doing you and kind of just let the world take you where it is and in this final scene yeah he doesn't really have a choice because his path took to the form he has to go back I don't think it's about like making this big moralistic choice I think it's kind of a weird read because I don't think there's anything that seems pointing to like this big moralistic choice I think it's pointing Wait, to what like moralistic choice you're just talking about how like what do you do do you stay or do you leave I don't think it's really about that I think he has to leave because he's older and he doesn't really have. I mean, he choice. could. He could choose to be with Otoko in like, her final moments. But where is he really presented as an option, Caleb? Because his, was like, it is, because his dad said he could? It doesn't say, like, you can stay with her forever. He just says, go visit her. Go no, be he, with say, your wife he right says, now. Uh, no, he literally says, you, you can just be in the parade in, uh, I forget the specifics. I think it's like Fukuyama, but I don't remember the specific city. But he literally says, just go be with her. You can be in the next parade. Yeah. I guess so. I just feel like it's more about... But I'm saying within this like, actual scene, right, with him, him and her, I just feel like it's like, like these like, cuts of them together and like, it's very like, you know, typical like, scene of cinema right, where it's like he's leaning over her and they're kind of almost one, right? And in this moment of one, we know what he has to do, which is he has to go and you know, make his fans happy because once you get to a certain point, like, you can't... He's no longer your man. He can't make these impetuous or rational decisions. He has no, to. I think it's definitely set up that he wants to be with her. And yes, we the, the decision is then not that he has to, but that he will because that's what she wants. 
Yeah, he's doing it because that's what she wants, not because it's his acting duty. But, no, but why does she want that from him? Because, because th th that's like the because... culmination of everything she's set up to be. He's, she wants to be yeah, but... with him as his wife, but not as his wife in the sense of, you know, that they had before, but in the sense that he's been accepted as his wife, and as his wife, she wants him to be a success, and the kind of symbol of that is being in this parade. With or without her being there to see it. Yeah. But what does she literally say? What are her exact words? Are you, you need to do this for your fans. Yeah. This is quite said, literally his duty as an actor. Yeah, he's, she wants she, him, she, might even, she might even use the word duty. Her first, like, whole thing was that she wanted him to be a better actor and doing, you know, yes. things for your fans because your fans is, you know, being a good actor. So by her saying yes. that, that's her saying, be a good actor for your fans, that's literally saying, like, this is the culmination of everything she wants him to be, so he has to do it for her. When realistically he's or she's already there, not for her, like his fans. Yes, so it's his actor's duty to his fans. Because it's not his actor's that duty. Yeah, this is like literally semantics. Yeah, so. this is definitely this semantics. This is literally also not semantics. Because you okay, but then don't disagree if it's if you don't want to go into the semantics because it's quite literally his duty. Like you can't argue yeah, but that. He's not doing it because it's his duty. He's doing it because his wife asked him to. His wife might be asking him, you know, in one degree removed. She might be asking him because she considers it to be his duty, but he's not doing it because it's his duty. He's doing it because his wife told him to. And if his wife didn't tell him to, he wouldn't have done it, even though it was his duty. So, exactly. yes, she knows. Is, technically, no. it is because it's duty, but it's by proxy. Then do you think that he thought there was any chance she wouldn't want him to? Based on everything about this character. Yeah, but regardless, yeah. there's still the choice there. She still could have... Otherwise. My point is, it's not really a choice because we know. And if she didn't say anything at all, like if she had been in, okay, if so, in some crazy hypothetical she had been sick and rendered incapable of speech, she would have stayed. Okay. First thing, I'm actually not. The, once again, Caleb, you're viewing this as like this is like an actual true story. This is like a movie, right? So we have to go with like the cinematic evidence, not like what we think would happen based on like how you feel about these characters as human beings, right? Like. As I'm saying, as a movie, this... The fact that he's even there <laughs> is the fact that it shows that he's doing... I didn't think about this movie that's, like, pseudo-philosophical. Like, w w what would make you even think this? I just don't understand, like, this whole moralistic choice of it all. We already What's talked the... about that for, like, 30 minutes. No, you didn't. What is there to show that, like... What, what about this movie is about, like... Well, like these, obviously, like, yes. In the shows. arc of the movie, you can tell that he's going to join the parade. But because this movie is... Because movies are important, because they're a reflection of real life, we feel that that's an important moment, because we think about what we would do if we were in that situation, because that's what humans do. And in this moment, we is like already set up that he wants to be with her. So the choice isn't his at that moment, it's hers, and he says for him in like that this is his duty, that he must do that. So he decides to do it for her. For what, because she said to, which is basically doing it for also, her. Like, is there a side, single, or really quick, is there no. a single scene of like people trying to like think about a choice? Like a single shot. Think I mean, about that whole a choice. Scene, yeah, yeah, like the, so, okay, someone contemplating uh, a decision. Specific, well, specifically, there I would can think of the one that's like really beautiful, where she's like under the trees and thinking about like what she's going if she should write the letter, and then Kiku shows up and he's like. We gotta go to the train. And it's like, oh, I guess I gotta stay. I, I guess I should stay. This is the decision I'll make. And that's the choice. Well, but the decision's made for, I guess. Yeah, I guess. It's, it's made, with. I mean, that she's they're, giving a choice. Yeah. They're able to make the decision. Yeah, sure. But I'm saying this is a movie. My whole point is like, which is really grasping is this is a movie of forced, uh, the first half of spontaneous decisions and the second half of forced decisions. Right? And like, thus, like, kind of, you know, contrasting the young versus the old, right? And I feel like we never get these, like, thought out, like, contemplated decisions because of the point of the movie. And I feel like it's kind of weird that you guys are saying all of a sudden the end it is because I really don't understand where that's even coming from. Like, where that's even at all evidenced by the movie. Outside of, I guess, like, these plot elements where you could say, if I was a human being, this is what I would do. But 
a not, movie. I don't think it's the point of it. That's not a so point I don't understand like, why it's being really brought up. We're saying though, but it's fine. We've already talked about this probably too sure. long. Sure. I do think in the background of that scene that you can see, like he's like kind of cut off halfway, but her father is like just kind of silently sobbing in the background. Oh yeah. Like, oh my god, it's so powerful. Oh. And they do that a lot. Actually, is like cut off people while they're only like halfway on the screen. And it's really interesting, and I think quite effective, especially there, because, like, he's not supposed to be the focus of the scene, but he kind of just, like, provides this, like, ambiance, I guess. Yeah. Of the sadness. Mm -hmm. Definitely a good element. Ooh. Ooh, there was another great scene where, um, uh, Kiki was, like, having an argument with his father, and he kind of, like, gets taken off to a side room by, I don't know if it was, like, his mother or somebody else. And she's basically like, you better, like, oh, yeah. shape up and apologize to your father. And, like, while they're having this conversation, we see from off screen the shadow of the father, like, approaching on the wall until he finally comes in the, into the shot. Like, that's amazing. That yeah. was so cool. As he, and then that's, like, as he hears, like, he could, like, reject him. It's kind of like his, mm -hmm. the shadow of his father coming over him, and he's kind of just, like, rejecting it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was his mother. I think it was his mother. It was an older lady, and it seemed like she said, like, Tosan, and so it's like, that's what a wife says about their, like, husband who they have children with. So I think it was... We ready to go into these awards? Let's I do think. it. Okay. Best quote. Hmm. Low key, I don't think I ever done any quotes. Let's see. Oh, uh, I would say from Mean Streets when uh, Charlie says, like, <clears throat> nobody tries anymore. Something about the way it's delivered just is pretty powerful and kind of cuts to the heart of, like, what, how Charlie is, like, viewing his situation, I guess. Jared, what's yours? The one in the Mean Streets where uh, they're like, whatever the soldier's name, this isn't, this is America. Oh, that's a great, yeah, it's a great quote. You can't do this, this is America! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also, I really like the Johnny Boy monologue, where he's talking to Michael, and he's like, My $10 ain't good enough for you, Michael. <laughs> so great, it's like so funny, and it's like, face you could really punch in that moment, right? Yeah. <laughs> also, like, all of the dialogue in that movie was so funny, like, when they're just having, like, bro conversation, they're always just like, hey, 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 back and forth. <laughs> Okay, best um scene. I think I already talked about mine, but I really liked the shot um when Otoku's returning to the like little inn that they stayed. Uh, her and Kiku stayed in Osaka, the first place they went to. Just like her, like slowly moving because she's so invalid. Oh, I really like that and all the darkness. I like the scene when, um, like, right after Otaku's, she's left the theater, and Kiku's, like, having his, like, great resounding performance, and she's kind of, like, walking alone, and she, I think she, like, just kneels, and, uh, she kind of just, like, or just, like sits by herself, like, kind of in some oh, park yeah. or on a curb or something, and there's this, like, moment of, like, tension where you're not sure if Kiku's, like, if he's just basically gonna fuck off and hang out with all of his theater mates and celebrate his victory or if, if he's gonna actually like remember uh otaku and you know kind of like cut her into his new life and then he eventually does and it's like this great like feeling of relief yeah cause I he, don't was, like, he was like i'll be right back i'll be right back but then it's like obviously he's shown that he's like you know he was at like the geisha place or whatever where all the actor boys like to fuck around mm -hmm. I don't know why you guys both didn't say this car chase scene in Mean Streets. 
shock. I think this is like one of like the all time like great movie scenes. Like Kevin Hart said, like um, it's a metaphor for the hand, right? But then I think Caleb said this too. Like all these like lights of the city, like to prelude it, and then we get like Michael, and he looks so sinister. And his guy, whatever his name is, he has a weird name. He's like shooting at them, and then just like all the blood, and like how devastated, like how wild Johnny Boy looks. He like goes out this window, and of course the motor crash, and just like this flurry of lights and this water spouting up, and then Michael just drives away all ruggedy. And like I think it's so great because that moment, I think you can actually finally in the movie. It's like, oh, this is the mean streets, you know? Like I get it. Also, I mean, killed once beforehand. Derek, do you have any idea why this is called the story of the last chrysanthemums? Like, what, where this title comes from? Chrysanthemum. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. But <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, the book makes a lot more sense. But yeah, it was very weird in the movie. Story of the last chrysanthemum. Anyways, I'm um, making a lot. Car chase scene, like at yeah. the end, whenever. Charlie like gets out of the car and he's just like kneeling in the middle of the street. Oh, it's like, so good. Dude. Just like see on his face where you're like, oh shit, I fucked up. So good. Okay. Best performance. Uh, hmm. I think this is kind of a tough one for me. Bit of a toss up. Derek, best performance. Um, I'll say Otoku. Otoku. Oh my gosh. I'm probably gonna go with Charlie. Harvey Keitel was Charlie. So Robert De Niro, Johnny Boy, close second. I would have said Harvey Keitel, but uh, since you took it, I'm gonna say Kiku. Okay. Um. Best favorite character? Otoku. Yeah, I'll say uh, Michael because he's sort of a very interesting oh, that was mine. Because <laughs> he kind of like starts yeah, off as like you think he's going to be like one of the boys because it does this introduction in the beginning where it kind of like shows their name underneath them like while they're kind of in their element. And uh, so we see Charlie, Johnny Boy, and Michael. And so you think it's going to be a story about, like, you know, three bros, you know, through the mean streets. And then Michael ends up being the antagonist. But it's kind of interesting the way he sort of evolves from your perception of him from being just kind of one of the guys in this neighborhood to being a fully fledged, like, sinister antagonist. Like you said in that final scene, he just looks so sinister. And his subtle evolution through the whole movie is pretty cool. Also, um... Those intros, kind of corny. <laughs> I like them. I don't know, man. I feel like it's just like a worse version of... I mean, I guess all these other things came after, but... felt oh, very young. So, Not quite fleshed. Then Giku can mean uh, it, the kanji makes up is uh, remainder, leftover, and balance of the chrysanthemum. And chrysanthemum, I think, has like some flower meanings. Um, so, let me look up that. It's literally a flower, I think. No, but it has specific meanings in, like, like flower okay. things. Um, oh, while it's going, Chinese though. Flower. flower, okay. Was Mean Street step up or step down from the King of Comedy? Step Ooh, down. that's a hard one. I'm going to step up. I think it's a lot more of a vibe than King of Comedy. I think King of Comedy obviously has great performance. Obviously, a step down performance, right? But I think almost every other aspect of the movie was stronger. God, that's a really hard choice. Yeah, I'll say step up, but they're both amazing. Story last chrysanthemum step up or step down from Shoot Street of Shame? Step up. All right, I'll just go step up for sure. I'll say step up. Derek, I thought Street of Shame was your movie. It was casual step up. Well, like, okay. Um, uh, one second. Gosh. So chrysanthemum in the Chinese sense can is one of the four main plants in traditional like Chinese watercolor, and it's like uh, 
really uh, important in like art in general. So very specifically art in like general, it's like it's a big deal. So this is like the last chrysanthemum. So it's like kind of all that stuff like about art and whatnot. Interesting. The more you know. So it's like art. Yeah, which is what I was saying. Oh my gosh. Matthew's reading the movie. Perfect as ever. Okay. Anyways. Um, uh, you guys can vote. Uh, no, you Derek, what do you vote for? It's too obvious. Yeah. You what? vote first, Matt. See, this is the issue. Because I actually like, was very, very mixed, which is kind of why I didn't want to vote. Um, All right, then I'll go first. Or, if you're honestly you go first. first. Yeah, if you're honestly mixed, then I'll go first because that would be fair. All right, I'll vote for the story of Last Chrysanthemum because I thought it was a very compelling movie. Uh, it was a romance that I was really invest invested in, and uh, Otoku affected me. And the shock comp was like really fucking good. Or I don't know, it was really well made. And that's uh, my take on it. I probably am too. I think a lot of the points where it's weak are like, like I think they're pretty similar quality wise, but I think a lot of the points where this movie was weak are like less to blame on Music Gucci than the points where um, Mean Streets is weak. So I'm going to get the slight edge story of Last Chrysanthemums, Chrysanthemums, but yeah. Caleb? Last Chrysanthemums. I see you, Matthew, edging onto the winning side at the last minute. No, dude. I, you guys literally just defended like the weirdest stuff. Well, you, we, not the time. We, we just said I, you know, we the story it. of this movie we is where this movie is we strong. We didn't think it was bad. You thought it was bad, so we said why we thought it was good, <laughs> and that's it. Oh, I'm just like, Caleb, I feel like I had so many positive things. I actually came in with like whole you know, idea how I want to talk about this movie, and you guys to like fight about this Well, we didn't want to fight about it. We just said our yeah. point of view, and you continued to say how we were No, wrong. I was... These guys were, okay, not the time. Anyways, um, thank you for listening. We are now on to the top eight. Ooh, that's we got it really it. Ah, my thing just left. No. no. My thing I wish exited out. This is a tragic moment. Okay, I saved it. We have Stanley Kubrick. We have John Renoir. We have oh jeez, I don't understand. We have Ozu. We have David Lynch. We have Martin Scorsese. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Kenji Mizuguchi. We have Andrzej Tchaikovsky, F.W. Murnau, and Woody Allen. Our next matchup is, I believe, um, going to be Kubrick versus Allen, unless anyone has any criticism. Is that all right? Wait, one second. Who are we doing? Um... We can do like Kubrick versus Allen, or we can do Renoir versus Murnau. Uh, Let's do Kubrick versus Woody Allen. Yeah. Okay. Let's get that one. Uh, so it's gonna be. Wait. So who are? It's gonna be. Um. Oh, where is this? Is the top? Barry Lyndon versus Crimes and Misdemeanors. And then three. What are the other two other than Murnau, Mizuguchi, Woody Allen, Ozu, Renoir, and Kubrick? Um, Isn't Barry Lyndon the one that like can't cut off me towards the end? All right, I'll just do it manually. It's all right. Um, all right. Yeah. Uh, Barry Lyndon. Yeah, I've never seen it. I've like this is when we talked about the movies we were doing. This is like that was like the first time I heard about it. Yeah, it is kind of like weirdly another hurting for like Kubrick's third best. I'm sure it's very good, but um, uh huh. It's when I haven't heard of it as much. But man, I'm excited for some of these. I think what's next after this Renoir versus Murnau? <sighs> That's gonna be such sort, a banger. Sort of Matthew just breaks down. <laughs> That's gonna be so good. Um, but yeah, until then, I'm Matthew Moore on behalf of my co host Caleb, Fer C Caleb Boy Ferguson and Derek Schwarzinski. Have a good day, night, whatever it is. Remember, watch more movies.